Um, uh, next up is, uh, let's see, Adishiswar, uh, who's got a paper with, uh, no, he's, sorry. I've got my uh, sheet confused, I'm sorry. Um, I drew the lines in the wrong place. He's the solo author on this paper, so he's got no co-authors. Um, limits of design and ensuring responsible outcomes from technology, and apologize for the strange introduction there, but I'm, I'm sure you will uh, take it from here. Thank you very much. Great, thanks so much, Jonathan. Uh, can you see my screen and can yes. you hear me? Fantastic, uh, great, uh, and uh, hi everybody. Um, it's my pleasure to present this paper uh, on the limits of design and ensuring responsible outcomes from technology. Uh, it actually builds up a bit on the previous paper. I tried to bring up some of these connections. Um, so, um, let's see. Okay. Uh, so my key message is actually very, very simple. That uh, design methods alone cannot ensure that a technology will lead to responsible outcomes. Ethics by design is alone not sufficient to provide guardrails that can prevent unintended harmful outcomes. And this is because there are many conflicts that arise once the technology is deployed, and that has to be managed properly as well. And this goes beyond the initial design of the technology. Um, careful deployment of uh, technology requires processes alongside design to ensure responsible outcomes. But this is not an actively researched area like design itself. And uh, this is basically where I want to draw attention that uh, there are certain kinds of management processes that are likely to be useful to manage technology deployments. And some of these might be generalizable uh, to other uh, cases. Uh, another point I will make as we go along is that just like ethics has served to uh, guide design, ethics can also serve to guide processes for uh, technology management. And uh, so together, ethics can really provide a common underlying foundation for design and management of technologies. Um, I'll cover some related work. Uh, and the fact that technology design can shape outcomes for good or bad has been known for a long time. Um, so many of us are familiar with Langdon Winner's famous paper, uh, that do artifacts of politics. Uh, there's many other works like uh, Penny Dukinoy's and Harold Thibbleby's paper called Design and Justice, uh, which proposed using Rawls' framework of the veil of ignorance when designing technology so that it does not unfairly disempower certain sets of users. Uh, and uh, there's of course a Scandinavian tradition of art safety design that comes closest to designing technology by preserving certain fundamental uh, uh, outcomes like democracy, uh, both in the process of technology design as well as in the intended outcomes from technology. Uh, but despite all this prior work, uh, I feel that a lot of recent work in design has not really focused on shaping outcomes. Um, so there's work uh, on user-centered design, co-design, et cetera, using ethnographic methods. And these are mostly focused on understanding users as consumers to drive technology adoption. But larger questions, like the purpose behind technology adoption have not been considered. Uh, further, in the investor-funded mad race for scaling technology, testing and user consultations to understand what positive and negative outcomes are arising from the technology have been really thrown out the window. Uh, the only objective is scale and anything that comes in its way is only a distraction. Uh, the design field has gone in a different direction of ethics by design, where methods like value-sensitive design have come up. Uh, but the problem is that such methods assume that the world is a static place and put ethical uh, guardrails can guide uh, uh, the outcomes towards something good. This I feel is a mistaken belief because complex decision points arise in dynamically changing environments and are heavily context dependent that need ongoing attention to be managed well and go beyond the technology design itself. Finally, academic research and design has mostly focused on evaluating prototypes from a design perspective, but has ignored the study of long-term deployments that go beyond the design stage, and which is where many complex issues arise. So an artificial difference has really emerged between research and practice. And the result of all this has basically been that since the Scandinavian participatory design movement of the 1990s, Design methods have not serious, uh, seriously considered an outcome-focused approach. And there has not been much research in guiding practice towards ethical outcomes, even though that's where most contextual dynamics arise that need management. So this is the second part that I want to focus on in this uh, paper. Uh, and uh, so here I use a case study of Mobile Vani, uh, which is a platform that's been presented at ICTD in different contexts in the past. Uh, and I'll describe that uh, in a minute. 
uh, and he, through that I'll outline processes that we had to develop to manage uh, the mobile money deployments so that responsible outcomes arose from the project. And this management was required not on the technology design, but on uh, the social technological interface when people begin to use a technology. And this is the interface where, like I mentioned, that's where many complexities arise, uh, which need careful management uh, beyond the design. And uh, Mobile Vani is basically an idea-based discussion forum on voice to empower communities to create their own media. Uh, the way it works is very simple, that people can call into an IVR system to listen to audio messages, or uh, they can record their own message. Voice messages left by the users can be moderated and published back on the forum for others to listen and respond. And uh, very much like complete radio and video systems, this enables users to ask questions, uh, record news, report grievances, and which can be heard by others and responded. And it's also very similar to other systems like CGNET Swara, Avaj Uttopali, and many others which have been presented at ICTD uh, in the past. So I'll next talk about the non-technological work that we had to do to manage many conflicts that we faced in the mobile money deployments. Uh, first, there was a realization that there are a lot of existing inequities in society and the technology we provide is going to be embedded in this fabric. Therefore, we have to work hard to ensure that our technology does not increase these inequalities. And this is almost the point that the previous paper also made where, uh, where uh, the, the wealth ends up being a determinant on technology adoption. Uh, so in our case, because many of our users were first-time users of any automated system, uh, uh, we created offline processes to train them through community workshops. But very soon, uh, once we started doing that, we saw that more skilled users were able to appropriate the platform for what they wanted to do with it. And in fact, deliberately tried to exclude many people who, for example, were not very comfortable with recording messages uh, nicely, and which also directly related to capacity issues, uh, which were often correlated with class issues, caste issues. Um, so it was really uh, marginalizing those people from uh, using the platform. And we had to work hard and we had to deliberately recruit volunteers from across different class and caste categories to make the platform more representative. It was even harder to bring women onto the platform for many reasons. Uh, for example, simply reaching women to tell them about the platform was difficult in itself. And we develop methods through self-help group networks to do this. Uh, so the main point I basically want to make is that we had to undertake very deliberate efforts uh, during the deployment to ensure that we were to some extent able to overcome uh, the existing inequities. Uh, the second aspect we had to struggle with was our inherent remoteness as designers and practitioners. We were building technology for users who were really not like us. And therefore, we needed processes to understand what they really wanted so that we could service them effectively. Um, after many iterations, we eventually settled down with a federated setup where essentially decentralization helped the users themselves to figure out what they wanted to do uh, with the platform. We broke up our earlier statewide network into district level clubs. And each of these clubs were constituted of volunteers who defined what kind of programs they wanted to run in their clubs. For example, in some clubs where there were a lot of farmers among the users, the volunteers tied up with local agricultural scientists and progressive farmers to get advice. In clubs that were youth dominated, career counseling programs were formulated by the volunteers and so on. In short, we had to set up feedback processes through which we kept actively in touch with the users and volunteers to understand what kind of programs and use cases could be relevant for them so that accordingly we could guide them and help them develop these programs so that they could then sustain the platform and take it forward on their own. The next aspect, very important, was to ensure strong internal accountability so that the volunteers or even the users did not misuse or misappropriate the platform and, in fact, formed an ownership for the platform so that they could prevent misuse on their own. This required some very interesting processes on incentives and setting the right precedence. Uh, we had to carefully understand, for example, why our volunteers are working with us in the first place. For example, some were driven by social incentives to support their communities. Some were eager because of the professional uh, development they experienced through the formal structures of work that we followed. Some loved the solidarity and team spirit. And while monetary incentives were not of significant importance for most, we had to design them carefully so that they could boost a signal to the volunteers to maintain a collective spirit and have mutual respect for one another. Uh, and we did this by creating a mix of individual incentives that were pro data on individual contributions 
and a growth incentive that was prorated on the overall performance of the club. We instituted a cooperative structure for volunteers to help each other in grievance redressal and approaching the government administration so that they could build a strong sense of solidarity. The eventual uh, result of all this has been that now there is very little attrition of volunteers and there is a very strong feeling of mutual accountability uh, that they have towards each other. And for many years, we have hardly spent any effort at all in monitoring and mentoring the clubs. They have been running pretty much on autopilot. The main point I therefore want to make is that careful management beyond the technology was necessary to establish norms of collectivism and mutual respect to preempt any misuse. Uh, next, uh, just like any other participatory media platform where most of the content is user generated, uh, mobile one is also susceptible to misinformation and abuse by the users. Uh, careful management has however been important to prevent such misuse and to send a clear signal to our users to have mutual respect for one another. All the content on the platform, for example, is moderated and we actively advertise that users can report any kind of cyberbullying or politically motivated content that may have slipped through the cracks. In all cases are then promptly redressed. Uh, and the tone with which the messages are spoken is also a very important filter to promote mutual respect. At the same time, we also emphasize on getting diverse opinions. Like uh, we've shown here, a content analysis of a strike that happened of contract teachers in, uh, in, in one of our geographies. And the volunteers consciously uh, sought opinions and experiences of people from diverse backgrounds. So information completeness as a guiding principle has helped send clear signals to our users that diversity is important and debate is welcome, but it needs to be done respectfully. And uh, so the main message is that developing such editorial principles and responding to grievances of users was therefore very essential to establish such usage norms so that nobody was harmed through the platform. Um, the next aspect, I'll skip over this in the interest of time, but this basically talks about uh, offline partnerships that we had to develop, uh, which again went beyond both our financial business model as well as uh, uh, the core work that we were doing uh, and which really helped build a lot of social and uh, institutional credibility for us, where we had to partner with local groups and uh, they uh, really took the platform forward. Um, so my goal in taking you through all this in detail was exactly to make the point that it is, a, it is very complex to manage the socio-technological interface of a technological system once it is deployed. It is not just about building technology with some design principles embedded in it. Rather, many complexities arise at the socio-technological interface and technologies therefore need active deployment management to guide them so that misuse does not happen and strong positive outcomes are realized through the technology. This ongoing management needs processes to be developed and adhered to, adhered to uh, at least uh, different aspects of the socio-technological interface. And while design is important, much criticism of platforms like Facebook, Uber, Alhar, etc. can be attributed to these platforms not having managed the socio-technological interface very well. I then further suggest that ethics can form that common underlying layer that can guide the design and deployment of the technology system. Ethics, for example, informs the objectives in terms of what values motivate the purpose of building a system in the first place. And this is typically captured as a theory of change in an ICTD project. These same values also uh, guide the design of the technology in terms of its user interface design or if it's using algorithms and what are the objectives coded in the algorithms and the wider relationships the technology system intends to shape in the overall ecosystem. And finally, these ethical values also need to shape how management processes are developed and adhered to so that continuous management of the technology can follow the same principles. Um, and uh, broadly, my point over here is that these common underlying ethical values, therefore, can guide all the three layers of, the, uh, of, of a technology system in terms of the objectives, the design, and how the deployment should be managed. So to uh, we've tried to show that design alone is not sufficient to ensure responsible outcomes, but that deployment management processes need to be developed as well. And ethics can serve as a common underlying framework for both design and management. And this area of deployment management needs more research by examining long-term deployments of technology to understand the complexities that arise at the socio-technological interface, and then to see how different projects have managed these complexities. Uh, some other directions uh, on which we're working is also to examine these different layers from an ethical lens to check for internal consistency 
that the same values that have guided the objectives are the same values also guiding the design and also the deployment management of the technology. Um, we're also uh, interested in building design methods that have some particular ethical principles built into them and to also examine the wider political economy of technology and the organizational culture because of which sometimes technologies are not able to completely embrace uh, these ethical principles. Um, so I'll uh, stop now and uh, I'll take questions. Thanks so I'll much. Probably stop sharing the screen, should I? Uh, well, you can leave this one up for a couple minutes if you want. Okay. Um, questions or reactions from from uh, the folks in the on the call? I've got one to start off while people think about questions, um, which is I'm I'm wondering. Uh, this is a little a little cute, but are you bumping into people from Facebook or Twitter and, and do you get to talk to them about this and how differently this sort of approach uh, may jive with the exact same users to some extent, if there's any overlap between your users and uh, what are those conversations like? Yeah, no, I'm, unfortunately I have not actually uh, spoken much. Uh, a few people from Facebook have attended uh, my talks where I've talked about some of these things, but uh, we've not had any reactions as such from them. But yeah, I mean, that's an important point that their strategies, uh, the design of the technology and how they manage it is very, very different from how uh, we've done it, for example, or many other platforms in the ICTD space. Thanks. I think Richard's got a question. Can can I un un unmute you? Um, sure, I can read out. Uh, First of all, thank you, Dr. Steph. Uh, I have a question about the ethics outlook that um, you're speaking of here. Um, while the notion of ethics that you do present is very agreeable, and you know these concepts are things that I agree with instinctively, and many of us do, um, I'm wondering to what degree do we work to incorporate the ethical lenses of our communities that we're working with, which is going to have some differences among the details as well as maybe even broader scale differences. Um, as opposed to, you know, us relying purely on our own ethical lens in design and implementation practices. Uh, sorry, I didn't completely get the question. Uh, are you asking that uh, how have, uh, how can ICTD projects incorporate such an ethical approach? Um, yeah, sort of, uh, when we're talking about ethics, we're not talking just about, um, our own ethical lenses, but we're also talking about the ethical lenses of the communities that we work with, which may have um, differences. So how do we work to um, create not just ju just designs with regards to uh, our own ethical lenses, but also the ethical lenses of the people that we're working to service and working to, you know, to be yeah, an ally? That's a very important yeah, yeah. No, uh, thanks for that. That's a very important question. Uh, so I didn't talk much uh, right now. The paper has some more of these details, but basically it's a it's a fundamental difference in the approach. Uh, so for example, participatory design, uh, the way the Scandinavian school originally thought of it was really in this very consultative manner that uh, the community needs to be consulted and everything needs to be done with them. Uh, in fact, if the community doesn't have the capacity, for example, to participate in these discussions, then They've had projects where they've actually worked on capacity building of the community so that they can then also participate and together in a, in a truly participatory manner build all of it. So those processes are really what we need to bring in uh, this uh, ethical uh, lens. Um, very interestingly, uh, but however, I mean, in this, uh, so some of the points that I was making about this whole investor fueled race that we're in, where platforms want to go very fast. So naturally, I mean, nobody has the time to invest in really having these consultations and really trying to figure out what the communities really want. Um, so it's really typically the objectives of the platform which they try to uh, push out. Um, and that is why I think also uh, Mobile Vani has been an interesting case uh, to think about it because we also were in the same boat. I mean, when we were doing Mobile Vani, we, we did not really consult the communities that what should the IBO system look like, what do they want to use it for. Uh, we sort of went in pretty much like a Facebook would. That, okay, here's a system, now let's see what happens. Um, so, uh, so really these were, I mean, uh, the ethical guardrails sort of that we were trying to work with, the values that we were trying to preserve, uh, was really what guided us to understand more carefully what the community wanted and then to respond and to do it responsibly. 
but many commercial ventures would not do that. Uh, they would they would not bother to sort of listen so carefully and uh, uh, and pay pay attention to what was the technology really doing, what outcomes was the technology really moving towards. Okay, as is often the case now, the conversation is really rolling and we're running short on time. So I'm going to summarize uh, two questions uh, from the chat, and this will be the, the, the last question uh, before we move to the next one. And let me see what I can do here. Um, uh, Grace asks, uh, was, is wondering if you give a tangible example of how a specific ethical principle can translate into specific design or an implementation decision. And Nazim is asking, um, whether information from the community could be rolled over to other stakeholders and how we can incorporate those power dynamics uh, between communities and governing organizations. Yeah, no, great. So, uh, my, I mean, I'm, I'm still fleshing this out, but uh, uh, power is really the keyword over here. Um, so, um, so one of the things that I uh, realize is that, um, uh, and power it can be incorporated as a design principle. Um, when we when we think of technology, um, so this is uh, historically people have looked at it more from the power of designers that designers have more power than users. Um, but uh, we need to look at power from a systems perspective. That there are a system once the technology is deployed, it's going to have many different stakeholders who will interact with it. There's direct users, there's indirect users, and the technology actually shapes these power dynamics. Uh, so. Uh, so one of uh, my uh, critical examples that I often use is uh, India has this biometric based authentication system called Aadhaar, which basically puts all the power in the hands of people who are wielding the technology. So this could be food, uh, subsidized food dealers, uh, Russian shop dealers who basically use the Aadhaar uh, machine. And uh, similarly, uh, with India moving towards cashless payments, uh, there are uh, uh, banking correspondents who, uh, pay, who who are supposed to dispense cash in remote rural areas, and they are the ones who are using these uh, point of service machines uh, on which people authenticate and then they withdraw cash. And uh, so this is a classic example where the person who's wielding the technology is really the one who has the power. Uh, the users, for example, these POS machines. One of the points I'm being I've, I've been advocating is that uh, these POS machines should be voice enabled, audio enabled, because without that people don't know what's happening on the machine. The ration dealers can bluff them that, well, we don't have enough uh, ration. We're not going to be give you the full units that you're eligible for. Uh, there have been many cases of fraud similarly by banking correspondents who basically don't tell people what is the actual withdrawal amount that they have taken. Uh, and then they use excuses that my machine is out of printing paper, so I can't give you a receipt. So, so those are examples where if we if you flip the whole power equation, if you think of this technology design from the weakest, uh, the, the, the stakeholder uh, with the least amount of power, then the technologies can be redesigned. Um, so, um, uh, so those are, uh, so that's really where we need to look at the broader stakeholder network, the broader ecosystem in which the technology is deployed and how it is shaping these power relationships. And that's where I think there is a scope for um, uh, doing, uh, doing, more careful design. Great, thank you so much.